It's a great pleasure to welcome Ms. Tonya Gonella Frischner, President and Founder of the American Indian Law Alliance and former member of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Thank you so much for joining us here today and for speaking with DESA News. Oh, it is my pleasure to be here and I'm honored. So thank you so much for inviting me. It is very impressive to read about your work and achievements for Indigenous peoples worldwide. You took, for example, part in the work which paved the way for the establishment of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues in 2000 and also the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. For the past 20 years, you have also participated in some of the major UN conferences. Can you share with Dessa News some of your past experiences promoting and protecting Indigenous peoples' rights? Um, I began my work in 1987 after I finished law school, and it was the Iroquois Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee, that brought me along and mentored me and took me to my first meeting at the UN in Geneva. And I was privileged to be with our elders from the Confederacy, from all the Six Nations, who showed me how this work needed to be done. But, but let me share with you and your audiences that the Haudenosaunee have been doing this work um, for many, many years. If we begin in 1977 or even go back to 1923 when a Cayuga chief from the Confederacy um, was sent to Geneva to discuss the situations on his territory that happened to be uh, in Canada. So the North American Haudenosaunee have been doing this for quite a while. In 1977, um, our delegation consisted of about 24 chiefs, faith keepers, elders, um, and support people who went to that first meeting um, that dealt with indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And that grew into, as you know, the WGIP, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations in 1982. Now, our people knew from the beginning uh, some very important issues and understood the legalities of what was going on. Um, the legalities back home um, almost exhausted in terms of remedies. So what is the next step? Why should we turn to the international forum to be heard, to ask for a seat at the table? Well, it goes back to our nation-to-nation -nation relationship with European countries and, of course, the earlier uh, arrivals here in uh, North America. And that's when our treaties were established, our diplomacy, so when the Europeans, when those brothers arrived on our shores, they found a very old world, not a new world. Thank you. You are a member of the Snipe clan of the Onondaga Nation. Can you tell us a little bit about your community and what recent achievements have meant for your people? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's very important um, to say the least. Um, it's critical in, in our work. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples creates another tool, another tool in our arsenal um, to do our work. But more importantly, what, what our people would like to see is this declaration be implemented on a local and national level. We understood during all of this work that the declaration would mean that indigenous peoples would have to breathe, breathe life into it, make it real, help implement it. Um, we worked very closely with governments for many, many years. Um, a working group that was held in Geneva on the uh, declaration went on for 14 years, so it was a very, very long debated instrument. I think one of the, the longest debated in UN history, but here it is. And now is the time for our people to use it. 
There are many important items on the agenda for the upcoming 12th session of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Education, Health, Culture. There will also be a discussion on the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples, which will be held here at UN headquarters in September next year. What are your hopes for the upcoming 12th session and what do you think will result from the World Conference next year? Well, the, the permanent forum will be um, having its 12th session uh, next month in May. Um, my hope is that it will continue its excellent work. It has been addressing uh, social and economic development. It has been addressing human rights. Um, the environment, culture, health, education. And those are issues that are still very critical um, on a domestic level for indigenous peoples throughout the world. If we look at health, the statistics um, are very, very high. And it's agreed that indigenous peoples are the most marginalized in the world. And attached to that are those terrible health statistics statistics, whether it's diabetes, whether it's tuberculosis, um, it, it goes on and on. And the interesting piece is that the statistics that you see in developing countries is basically the same in developed countries. So we need to look at both situations in developing and developed countries when it comes to indigenous peoples in terms of health. Um, violence against indigenous women is going to af affect the health, not only of the woman, but the family and the community. And it's something that I believe governments need to invest in um, and fund so that those issues can be addressed. Education, is important, but including our life ways and our languages must be attached to that as well. Um, so we hit on health, education, and the third, culture. Culture. Now, I smile because when I, when I think of culture, I think of being in a room with 2,000 indigenous peoples, all speaking different languages, but when we're together in our own meanings, we are speaking one language. Our relationship to Mother Earth is identical throughout indigenous communities. Um, and that relationship on a spiritual and um, emotional level concerning our land, our resources, our territories um, is very similar, almost identical throughout the world. So it's, it's quite amazing when we come together and we reach consensus on an issue because we're thinking very much in a similar way. Thank you. The world community is currently preparing for the development agenda beyond 2015 and online consultations have been held on a number of topics. There was also an e-discussion on indigenous peoples and in inequality in this context, where the recognition of indigenous peoples at national and international levels, as well as their collective rights, the enactment of their free, prior and informed consent and the establishment of partnerships for development were some of the seven top priority areas mentioned. What are the most important priorities, as you see it, to secure indigenous people's rights beyond 2015? Well, I think addressing um, it, with all of the resources of the UN and the resources of governments is the issue of poverty. Um, poverty is the overarching um, theme, if you will, that affects indigenous peoples when it comes to health, education, our youth, our women. Um, it affects 
everything across the board. And the Millennium Development Goals have that, that goal in mind to address poverty and how it affects all people. So indigenous peoples need to be very much a part of the outcome document, a part of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and how will development look um, on indigenous territories, uh, not only now, but past 2015? In place is the Declaration with its minimum standards. Development on, uh, in indigenous communities must be applied with the Declaration in mind whether it's extractive industries, um, building industries, whatever it happens to be, um, it has to be sustainable for indigenous peoples. Um, the, the principle of free prior and informed consent must be applied in all cases of development. Um, and that includes our human and collective rights, our individual and collective rights must be applied. So we have the Declaration as a framework um, to look at development, to look at poverty, to look at youth and children and women and elders and all peoples within our communities, um, which must be applied seriously, not only on a local, national, but international level. Um, and we must begin that implementation in due haste. The world has never faced such a large youth population, with about 40% of the global population under the age of 25, and with 67 million of them representing the indigenous youth community. How do you view the role of indigenous youth today, and how can we ensure that their voices are heard and incorporated as we move towards and beyond 2015? Well, for the past 12 years um, at the Permanent Forum, or I should say 11 years, we have seen um, indigenous youth take on a very strong role and make very strong statements and encourage um, not only the Permanent Forum, but indigenous leaders um, and those attending the permanent form to hear what they have to say. They have some very clear concerns. And one of their strong concerns that I've observed um, is climate change, is global warming. This world is going to be left to them. That is the reality. Those are our future leaders. So our responsibility is to mentor those future leaders and to bring them into the discussion. That is how they're going to learn and that is how they're going to be ready to take on leadership roles. And, and that's not just for indigenous youth, that's for all youth throughout the world. We need to make sure that the youth, not just indigenous youth, but all youth, have a voice in the MDGs, in outcome documents, at the permanent forum, at the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. The youth must have a voice. Thank you so much for joining us here today and for sharing your experiences and the important work that lies ahead. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you from, my, from myself and my community.